Uh, okay, I'm getting my. All right, I think I'm in position now. Okay, so before we get into before we get into all the crazy new stuff, which I'm going to try, and it's my grandmother. I had two grandmothers who were bridge players, and my mother's mother was fond of saying, "Wow, she's from Fresno. Wow, if you make them all, you're not bidding high enough." And bridge players will understand. If you make all your bids, you're not bidding high enough. Uh, so I've got some other crazy things I want to talk about. John has brought me back to the question of grapes. We do have a class of 2022, that is grapes that I grabbed in 2022, which will fruit in 2023. We do have a class of 2023, which will fruit in 2024. So I want to do a quick musketeer roll call so you have something to look forward to. These are the ones that you didn't taste this August. So I grabbed the roll six, uh, they didn't all take. The ones that did work, which would be class of 2022, was Fern Munson. Fern Munson was pure Welchie and it was late. So I said to heck with Fern Munson, cut off its head. And now we have Neptune and Tom Cord in place. They're very, very successful grafts. The grafts kind of went like this. And we have to like train them to go down like this. Uh, we'll be doing that 12, 3, 12, 4 to make proper cordons out of them. And they all went inside and outside of the fence. And they went inside and outside and inside and outside. So it's going to be a an operation to get them out of the fence. But the Neptune is very good. It's large, it's yellow, it's crunchy, it's seedless. It has a very strong bouquet of isoamyl acetate. And if you don't know what smell that is, it's what my father would call banana oil or aircraft dope. If you've ever driven by Earl Scheib and it smells like car paint, it's like, oh, that's a lovely smell of bananas and pears, except it's car paint. That's isoamyl acetate. And it's not pure isoamyl acid, it's rounded out to make a very nice flavor. So I was enormously impressed when I, I did a, I tried a few Neptune berries uh, for my my, <clears throat> for my find at um, Hillcrest. Tom Cord, uh, Mr. Suverid has graciously been sharing his Tom, Tom Cord with it. It's one of the best new grapes to come along in a long time. It has all the welty flavor you want from a Concord and all the crunchy seedlessness you want from a Thompson seedless. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome it. Um, it's fun to compare Tomcord, which is a small crunchy berry. Tomcord is a small crunchy berry in the Concord tradition with on the other hand, Everest, which is a great big toasted marshmallow, which is soft and whooshy all the way through. And it just melts in your mouth. Oh yeah, oh, the Everest is a good one. Yeah, the Everest is a good one. So they're both welchy, they're both seedless, but one is huge and soft, one is small and crunchy. And the Tomcord is said to have some plum notes. So anyone who's a fan of plum notes in grapes will probably like the Tom Court. The Fern Munts, uh, next door to Fern Munts, we have Diamond Muscat. Diamond Muscat is a bizarre grape. It's what you call an industry grape. It had a trunk diameter of at least four inches to it in the same time that all the other grapes planted at the same time in 2018, I believe it was. It's been four years now. Uh, developed a one inch trunk. So it's an enormous grape. It wants to put up canes 50 feet in every direction. It's not gonna work in the 10 foot sections that I have there at, uh, at Bancroft because we went, the, 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 the fence posts are every 10 feet. So I put the grapes every 10 feet. Not gonna work for summer muscat, not gonna work for diamond muscat. They want to be 50 feet in a row in Bakersfield, industry grapes. So what I did is I whacked off the head and I put in a little niblet, two buds long of Iona. Iona goes back to the 19th century it came from the Hudson River Valley. Uh, as you go up from New York on the Hudson River, it's a beautiful uh, valley up there. Uh, there's a little island in that river called the Iona Island. And there was a dentist there, Dr. Grant, who bought that island and he developed grapes there and he, he bred the Iona. The Iona is an amazing grape. It has tremendous virtues and tremendous flaws. The virtues of it, is it has a taste of every different kind of fruit that you can imagine. Back in the day in the 1970s, you would make your jello, or your mom would make your jello by pouring boiling water on these little packets, which would be red and green and yellow, because you got five or six different kinds of jello strawberry, raspberry, lime, lemon, whatever. So once you pour the hot boiling water, it dissolves the jello. And if you took five different boxes of jello and poured boiling water on them, and then you mix it with ice water and then you put it in the refrigerator. But if you, if you, at the point where you have five different boxes of jello and it's all melted to a melt in your mouth consistency, that's what the Iona grape is like. It's famous for exquisite texture of being absolutely melting to this right all the way down to the pit and having a, a, a lovely fruity bouquet. It's a long lasting grape. 
um, but the leaves as grown in New York, the leaves were found to be very bad and the, um, the roots were found to be very bad. Here in California, of course, it's much better because we just have a much better climate for grapes. And of course, if you have a root stock, it's easy enough to graft it and then you have it on a, a good root stock. So it took me many, many years to get this from, Lou, from Lon Rombo of Blessed Memory. He's my grape guru uh, up in Oregon. Finally got a cutting, was able to do many grafts of it. One of the grafts was on this enormous you know, diamond muscat rootstock. And that took, so we have Iona to look forward to. It's gonna be an absolute stunner. The bad thing is that the other half of that four inch wide trunk died. So I'm gonna to have to get in there with a saw and we're gonna make a whole thing about that. We're gonna do a video of it. We're gonna do some, some surgery over that. We're gonna leave a great big gaping wound in the side of the vine. It's gonna be quite the quite the, the, the tree surgery project. Okay, so. Yeah. It's pretty much the Hudson River is pretty much straight up and down. So um, if you get on a ferry at New York in about October or November, they'll take you on a leaf peeping cruise. You go straight north on the Hudson River as far as Poughkeepsie, as these are all the New York names, as far as Poughkeepsie, as far as West Point, uh, all these little towns up and down the Hudson River, and it just goes straight north, um, I guess all the way to Canada. I don't know. Uh, and then, and then, the, then the boat turns around and goes back. But Iona is about, uh, about a two or three hour cruise north of New York City. Okay, so Mouseketeer roll call, the other grapes we got coming. Uh, we got Delaware and Jefferson. Delaware is, uh, this could be on, on the buffalo. The buffalo is very boring. So Delaware is a mix of fruity notes and musty notes, like something you find in an attic. That's literally what has this dusty, musty flavor to it, as well as exquisite fruity notes. Also Jefferson. Jefferson is an offspring of Iona. Uh, much prettier than Iona, has much of the good flavor of Iona, um, but you do leave fully 40% of the berry on the stem. You pull the berry off and there's like 40% of the berry staying on the stem. So that's why Jefferson never never really worked. Uh, but the other parent is Concord, which gives it, makes it a much better uh, vine in the ground, much tougher vine. So they thought it was gonna be the Iona fruit on a Concord vine, but it, it wasn't. Okay, Kuka, Kuka turned out to be boring. I'm gonna put Marquis on there. Basically Marquis is the counterpart of Everest. Everest is the great big new blue Concord. Marquis is the great big new yellow seedless Niagara. So if you've seen those jugs on the shelves in the supermarkets, you get the big old jug of Concord, big old jug of what I affectionately call horse piss Niagara because it's so strongly flavored. Um, that's what Marquis is. And the, the, re the release bulletin notes on it say that the American flavor, the characteristic American flavor of Marquis becomes stronger as it is allowed to hang on the vine after ripeness. So if that's the kind of thing you like, let your Marquis hang. Mattersfield Court, um, if anyone's read Brideshead Revisited, it was a famous uh, ITV uh, program when I was growing up in London with Jeremy Irons and Anthony Andrews. The original for Brideshead Revisited was a famous farmhouse in Herefordshire called Mattersfield Court. And of course they had very fancy aesthetics, very fancy, um, the Earl was very much into needlepoint. It was that sort of a bizarre, only, only in England kind of a place, Mattersfield Court. So they had a, an eponymous grape there that was bred by their, in the late 19th century, by their, their grape man when, when growing grapes for the Duke of Devonshire was quite the thing. And so this grape is called Mattersfield Court and it's supposed to be a, a lovely, mild, muscat flavored grape. So I ordered that specially from the United Kingdom, brought it over and we'll see if that's any good. Sato Giants. Sato Giants is named after a Japanese baseball team. It has a cleft down the side like a peach, except it's got three clefts. And I think it's seedless and supposed to have a mild muscat flavor. So that'll be fun to try Sato Giants. Goldfinger, we did see a cluster of Goldfinger. I want to have that in-house. Uh, that's the one where the, the grapes are long and thin like chili peppers. Uh, on the last one, Duchess and Verdelay. Duchess is Duchess County up the Hudson River again, a New York grape. Duchess has little white dots on the berries, which is kind of fun and it has a very racy acidity to it to where it never cloys. Like Reliance, I love Reliance, but it's like a pink fudge. It's like so honeyed and so rich. By the time you've had like five or six berries of Reliance, like, okay, I know what that tastes like. Whereas with Duchess, you can just sit there and keep eating and keep eating and keep eating. It's got the comeback sauce on it, as they say in the South. Also, Reliance is brought to my friend, Scott Jones. Scott Jones is Landscaping business, and we, we've been in touch with about grapes since the 1980s. He brought this one to share last summer. Not a lot to it, but it has a wonderful, crisp, crunchy texture to it. Extremely refreshing on a hot August day. So I didn't want to be without Verdelet. It's a French wine grape. Okay, so that's the quick, the quick uh, 
the quick rundown on the legitimate grapes. As far as non-legitimate grapes, uh, we have those two. Um, people asked me about the cotton candy. Uh, Jared Rydelic uh, did a review of my grapes. S like seven or eight people wrote in to ask about cotton candy, which was not even one of the grapes that I grew, but they wanted to know about it and people ask me about it all the time. So I saw it on the net, I ordered it. I have no idea if it's the real thing or not. By the time I know, that seller will no longer be in action. So I'm growing it out as an internet novelty grape and we'll see if it's if it's really that or not. But I have cotton candy, I have witch figures, I have uh, what they call moon drops. I have no idea if they're real, so I'm not gonna sell them until I know. So please don't ask me until I, I give the word. Okay, so moving on to more exciting stuff. Blackberries, God love them, are not worthy of a full, uh, a full day's yak, but I do wanna make a quick report on the blackberries that I've been doing it college area community garden out at San Diego State. We had a PVC hoop house. I was allowed to plant 10 blackberries. I picked a selection of new varieties so I could trial them here in San Diego. Some worked, some didn't, and I'm sure you will want to know. So I did Columbia Star and Columbia Giant. They were extremely highly rated for flavor. They were coming out of Oregon, very newly released from Chad Finn. They grew very well, but the problem with them, even though they were rated for high for flavor, and even though the flavor was good, was that in San Diego weather, they would do Go back here so you can get it. They would do a thing like this, sorry, thing like that, to where there would just be this very tiny window of ripeness, and there would be no good on either side. And that's, I think, due to the fact that they're just much hotter weather than they do up in Oregon. So I'm going to have to say no on Columbia Giant and Columbia Star. They are Oregon blackberries. Let the people in Oregon do them. On the other hand, oh, also Triple Crown. I had to say no to Triple Crown. It had problems coming back. I think there was a chill hour issue. And yet it came back at UCSD, which is right by the coast, which makes no sense. Anyways, uh, Triple Crown, I do not have conclusive information on it. It has good reputation, but uh, it certainly was not functioning at, uh, at San Diego State. Now, exciting news. Wild Treasure does very well. Wild Treasure is a very tiny, small berry. It's a very thin cane, very thin leaf. We have it all across the south fence at Bancroft, making a very beautiful effect because it has little tiny leaves. The berries are small. They have a mustardy kick of wild blackberry flavor. Uh, they're like blueberries in the sense that they're the kind of small fruit that you would put in a muffin. So if you like blueberry muffins, take a handful of wild treasure berries and do blackberry muffins and you'll be very pleased with it because as I say, they have that uh, wild blackberry kick to them. Uh, once it's ripe, it all, of course, all the flavors come together very nicely. So um, it's a very wimpy little plant, but if you want a small berry with a kick to it, wild treasure is good. The ones I'm super excited about though are the three from Arkansas, which would be Osage, because this is Dr. Clark and he names them after Indian tribes. Osage, Ponca, and Caddo. Osage has shown itself to be disease-free, extremely rugged, stands up by itself, what they call an erect, no need for a trellis, and they're thornless and they're disease resistant and they're extremely productive and they're extremely tasty. So I'm very pleased with Osage. I would highly recommend it to anybody here in town. Um, very rough uh, growing conditions out at uh, San Diego State and doesn't phase Osage at all. I'm very pleased with it. Uh, Caddo and Ponca are from the same line of breeding, both erect, both thornless, both very productive. Dr. Clark uh, has been breaking his back. He just retired, but throughout his whole career, he's been breaking his back to give folks the high sugar, low acid, high aromatics fruit that they want. And of course, people harass him for hyping each new release more than the last, but I've been you know, trying to keep up with him and sure enough, they, they do get better and better. And I've only had the one berry of Ponca, but I was blown away. It was not like a nasty, sour, thorny blackberry like my folks had at their house in Pacific Beach since the 1970s. It was like candy. It was sugar and flavor and not too much acid, just enough to, to balance it out. So I would highly recommend Ponca. We're gonna be getting a bunch of those at BCS. Give it a try. It should be easy as pie to, to propagate. Uh, just put an eight inch cutting in the ground and off you go. It will travel by roots and come up a little bit and then you'll have a nice grove. But you, uh, unlike the, the thorny ones that you have to trellis every year, which is a real pain in the neck, uh, these three from Arkansas are all erect growing. So they will make little thickets and you never have to worry about them. They will stand up by themselves like small trees. It's a very, very good berry. Okay, now on to the delicious, is Mark crazy or is Mark not? Um, Blueberries. Uh, going back to the 1980s, I lived and died by the 1980s fruit sheets that this glorious organization put out. And it was a time when I could quote them chapter and verse. But uh, the decades move on, the, the research continues to come out. Uh, we continue to experiment, we continue to push the limits. And 
I am willing to move forward on the idea of doing blueberries, even though they are profoundly out of town for, for San Diego. Cactus are in town, but how many will put your fruits so you can really want to eat? You want to make like a pie out of a bunch of fruits? I've never heard anybody doing that, but blueberry pie, blueberry jam, these are all popular things. We're never going to be able to do the good blueberries from Northern California or from Maine, but the, the scientists are working hard, same as on blackberries, to come up with blueberries that are low chill and high aromatics and disease resistant, and we just have to keep trialing them until we find the ones that click. You know, it's like a, it's like a safe cracker. You got to go clockwise, counterclockwise until you find the ones that click with our climate and with our palates, right? And I can't make that decision by myself. Um, I have to have the taste tests so that everybody gets a chance to try and then say, oh, I like this one. So the main issue with blueberries for us is that our soil is alkaline because everything evaporates here rather than having the constant rain and the constant breakdown of organic material like you get in the Northwest where it's you know azalea country, camellia country up there because they had so much acid, so much organic matter. Now, what you got is Vaccinium arboreum, which is a tree from the Southeast it's a very tough tree. It's probably the one vaccinium that doesn't have that bizarre root chemistry to where it has to be an acid decomposing organic matter. It's perfectly happy um, up to about 6.5, right? So if you throw down a little bit of 6.5 pH, so that if you throw in a little bit of sulfur, um, even if we do have alkaline water, it'll be decades before it gets uh, to be too high of a pH for the vaccinium arboreum. And the research is in, a lot of science has been done on this, and the vaccinium arboreum does work as a rootstock. It doesn't impair the, the fruit production or the, the taste of the fruit. And it, it, it works long-term. They found, they've, uh, they've gone back and found groves that were grafted over in like the eighties and they were still large and productive and, and functional as far as producing blueberries. Um, we are in this club, very grateful for the expertise of someone like uh, Patrick Schilling who has done this before and can give us the hot tip, which is that in his experience, as he reports to me, the, there's a tendency for the top bits, the scions, to overgrow. And as I say, forewarned is forearmed. And so I have three strategies for trying to address that problem, which is, it's the kind of thing where if we, if we sold it to the customers and said, well, this is a, this is a trouble-free blueberry, and they put it in their backyard and they forget about it, it, you might well get 30 or 40 canes coming up and it overgrows and it burns out the, the rootstock, the whole thing falls over and dies. And we don't want that. So forewarned is forearmed. So my first strategy is to make real clear to the people who buy it that you're gonna to have to keep an eye on this. So if you see like 20 or 30 shoots coming up, nip them off, keep it down to one or two the first couple of years, and then you know six or seven, and then eventually nine or 10, you know, as the years go by. Vaccinum arboreum is not a wimpy rootstock. It will grow into a 20 foot tree, but it will do so slowly. It does not move to the same rhythms as cultivated blueberries, which throw up canes and have fruit and throw up canes and have fruit almost like a, almost like a grapevine. That's how, how growthy they become under generations of cultivation, whereas arboreum is a, is a forest tree. And if you respect it as a slow growing rootstock, eventually it will uh, turn into a very substantial blueberry producing machine. So number one, educate the customers about the nature of Exinium arboreum and to keep the top growth uh, in, you know, uh, I don't wanna say in tandem, in harmony, what do I say? Uh, in check, yeah, keep it in check so it's not out of control. Number two, I think it would be smart to let the Vaccinium arboreum seedlings have a couple of at least four years to develop a solid, what you call a head start, right? A solid root ball and a solid caliper to the, to the trunk before you start in on the grafting. Because I've got a, a fellow up in Reeseville Ridge, nursery in Tennessee is gonna do me a hundred starts of Vaccinium arboreum. I wouldn't want to graft until I saw some you know, substantial root ball and substantial caliper uh, uh, trunk, trunk to it. And so I think that'll help a lot. It's very different with grapes. You can take a stick, an unrooted stick of rootstock and a stick of science, stick them together, put it in a pot and the grape will be fine uh, because the, the, the rootstock and the, the grape will, and the, the sign will be in perfect harmony. But as I say, with the arboreum, we, we have to be very careful about that. The third, the third strategy, which I think is, is, is just common sense, is, is if we grow out, uh, there might be, I don't know, 20, 22 low chill varieties. So expansively, if we grew all those out, and looked at their behavior, we could determine which ones were the super vigorous, which ones were the moderate, and which ones were the less vigorous. Emerald, for instance, that's on everybody's list of uh, Emerald Jewel Misty, Emerald Jewel Misty O'Neill. That's a standard one for Southern California. Emerald is notorious for sending out lots and lots of great big thick canes and having 
blueberry is the size of a 50 cent piece. Okay, very good, Emerald. But Emerald is not one that I would put on a Maxinium arboreum rootstock. That would be a, a super vigorous one. Now, which ones are the less vigorous? Well, they don't advertise that very strongly uh, in the release bulletins because it's a little embarrassing. But those are the ones that we would want. Um, now, actually, there was one called Blueberry Bucks. Uh, Buxus is Latin for boxwood. Obviously, boxwood comes from Latin buxus. And they had one they called the boxberry, which grew very slowly and densely like a boxwood hedge and had good wild blueberry flavor. I said, that's the one I want. I want the wild blueberry flavor and I want the less vigorous growth habit because that's the kind of animal that would go well on the Vaccinium arboreum rootstock. So I got, I got one of those and we'll, we'll see, we shall see. Now, does that yeah. wild, the one with the wild flavor, does that require more chill time or does it go okay here? Uh, the, the, there is the usual discourse of chill hours that we all we all know and love. The Buxberry, I think, is it's marginal. It might be three or 400 hours. Okay. So it's, it would be a flip of the coin whether I could get it to work at uh, the bank rock. anywhere near usually 300 hours. Right. Uh, the, um, I've been in correspondence with Mark Ehlenfeldt, who is one of the leading researchers on this. And I said, well, how about Cara's Choice? Because Cara's Choice is the one that's coming up over and over again is the one with the best aromatics ever. Not that it can touch the, the Northern California ones, but within the Coram Bosom, uh, Cara's Choice is, is kind of the one that comes up as everybody's favorite. And that's listed as five or 600. So I was discussing this with Ehlenfeldt and Ehlenfeldt says, yeah, we just make these numbers up. Go ahead and try it. <laughs> so, you know, it's a kind of, if you didn't know that we were crazy in this club, I mean, tonight's the night you find out. We will try it and we will, we will let you know, you know, that's, that's the spirit that, that animates this club. Yeah, but that is a very good question. There, there's so many, uh, there's so many variables uh, that, that make growing blueberries tricky. The chill hours is one, the pollination is another one. One thing we don't have is bugs. I never saw a pest on them. I grew them for several years at uh, the College Area Community Garden, never saw a pest on them because the pests don't recognize them because they're so out of town, they're just, we just don't have them. Um, now, uh, okay, now this is where we get into the, you know, you know, everybody look around, we all recognize each other, we don't have any federal agents in here. Um, as far as smuggling plants in, it's a very dubious business. Prometheus, as we know, was tied to a rock and his liver was pulled out because he gave the gift of fire to mankind. If it's a university that's public, funded by public money, you know, by the state of Florida, by the state of California, the, you know, UC or UF, um, they do, they get that money for the good of the people of that state. And if other states should happen to benefit, I think that's a very good use of public money. Uh, the one I'm most interested in, the blueberry I'm most interested in is Kestrel. This is a low chill, high aromatics variety that's came out of the University of Florida a couple of years ago. Everyone is raving about it, but you can't get it because they were very protective of it in the first couple of years. Now, a couple of years have gone by, uh, Kestrel has been tested all up and down with the growers of Florida. Word is coming back that in actual production circumstances, that a plant like Winter Bell will produce 11.1 .1 pounds of berries per plant. That's the most productive, 11.1, .1, that's, that's enough for a pie or two. 11.1 .1 pounds of berries per plant. Kestrel, on the other hand, is listed as one of the least productive, producing 1.65 pounds of berries per plant. Now, reading that, reading that as a someone who gets paid to produce blueberries in Florida by the pound, uh, which one are they going to go for? All right, obviously the one that produces, you know, five, five times as much. Uh, but as a, an aesthetic person, I'm like, I just want the one that tastes the best. I don't care. I want the one that's going to give me the, the aesthetic experience. So I if they're, if they're inclined to be less protective of Kestrel now because they found that it's, it doesn't meet the needs of the, of the Florida folks, then uh, and if there's any way I can, uh, you, know, you know, Willy Wonka, Willy Wonka and the Everlasting Gobstopper, I'm sure you've all seen that movie. If there's any way we can get that to, to California and try it in California, now that the Florida growers have rejected it, that's, uh, that would be uh, information. That would be information that would be, would be good to know. Does it do well here? Does it produce tasty fruit here? Um, inquiring minds want to know. But this is all highly illegal, so you didn't hear it from me. Okay, moving on from yum berries. There's different curves. Like, I know nothing about this plant. Okay, I'm working on it, and I've kind of learned stuff. Okay, I'm a total expert on it now. And we're all kind of on different curves in different places. I know nothing. I know nothing about the yum berry. I've never had one. I've never even seen one. There is a Facebook group dedicated to it. There's a lot of buzz about the yum berry. 
Uh, it's from Southern China. What else do we get from Southern China? Lychee. Okay, and if it, you know, if the Southern Chinese uh, can produce the lychee and, and be impressed with it, they and, they and they like the yum berry as well, I'm willing to give the yum berry a try. The word from the people who are trying to bring yum berry to California is that there's twice as much acreage devoted to yum berries in Southern California as there is dedicated to apples in, in the United States. I don't know if that's true or not, but for a fruit that we have never heard of, I mean, because I've never heard of it, um, so I can't imagine anybody else has ever heard of it. Young May, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yum berry is supposed to be a corruption of Young May. Uh, I will forbear to scribble out the kanji, though I'm the kind of person who scribbles out the kanji at the drop of a hat. But yeah, it does have an actual Chinese name, as does the lychee and every other plant that they grow in China. Um, yeah, if you've seen the list of Yang Mei, it's the same one. It looks, it has a nasty resemblance to Arbutus unido, which is the notorious fruit that un edo in Latin means I only eat one because it, it tastes like paste. Uh, you've probably seen them. They haven't UCSD. They're like a little red strawberry thing. It looks like a, from a distance, you could mistake it for a lychee. It looks kind of like a manzanita tree, but you eat one, it's like, okay, no point in this at all. They look exactly like that, which may be one reason why we haven't had a lot of enthusiasm for them. But um, at this point, I'm on the learning curve. I'm like in the foothills of the learning curve. And I'm just growing out a bunch of rootstock. Uh, in due time, the people with the science will emerge as they always do in clubs of this nature. The people with expertise in grafting them will emerge because apparently it's tricky to graft. There's a whole humidity issue you have to have in the box and keep it all moist in order for the graft to work. Okay, we can do that. Um, but it looked like a fun one. And as I say, with the blueberries, I don't want to do stuff that's impossible. I don't want to do stuff that's too easy. I want to do stuff that's challenging enough to be interesting and that people will buy because they wouldn't have the opportunity to get blueberries grafted on Arborium. They wouldn't have a chance to get yum berries grafted on Mirica serifera. Now, again, do not buy my Mirica seriferas, which I've been growing out lovingly for the last three years, and take them home and grow them out and eat the wax berries. I want you all to be good students of Latin. Cera, C-E-R-A, Cera is wax. Cerifer is a wax-bearing fruit. Murica cerifera is the wax-bearing murica. So the southern waxberry is easy to grow. It grows very fast. It doesn't have a frank, you don't have to have magic bacteria in the soil to grow it. It just grows fine. But you don't eat those. Those are the waxberries, which is the rootstock. So I try to put yumberry RS. <laughs> So that's your key, folks. RS means it's a rootstock, probably best to wait until it's grafted, and then you will have something fun to take home and you will get fun fruit. Okay, winding down here. That, those are the two big things I want to cover. Artocarpus china is just the one plant. The thing with Artocarpus is that the jackfruit is kind of mild, tastes like juicy fruit gum. The chempedak is a little wild, is what I say to my mother who wants to know what I'm doing with my life. Oh, I'm still busy at CRFG, mom. What are you growing, Mark? Again, she's from Fresno, so she knows about apricots and almonds and things like this. So she's, what are you growing, Mark? Well, I'm, 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 I'm growing a plant that has chempedak flavor. Chempedak flavor, what does chempedak taste like? Well, it's, it's a fruit like, it's about 35 pounds and it's spiky and it said to have a bouquet of fermented urine. <laughs> That's nice, Mark. So the, the thing with the chempedak is if you were born and brought up to the chempedak, you probably love it, right? Because it's an Asian thing. And it's all those artocarpus fruits are well woven into Asian culture. Um, probably a little too wild for us. So this is why I got all excited when I saw the china for sale because the china is a hard hybrid of the jackfruit, which is mild, and the chempedak, which is probably too wild. So the, the reviews of it, I've tried to post them on Facebook. The reviews of it are that it is the fruit kind of hits right in the middle, right? A good balance between the mild and the wild. And so I thought, you know, that's what we want. It's supposed to have a good, you know, a reasonable amount of cold hardiness. The actual tree is dying of cold now, but according to the hype, it's supposed to have good cold hardiness. I'm, I'm always trying to balance the, you know, the evidence of my actual eyes and the actual plants against what the nursery says. And I will read you the, uh, the statement from Robert Knight. Um, this is a statement he released um, when he we introduced the China. Hybrid between jackfruit and chempedak, or origin Malaysia. Fruit small, averaging 2.4 kilograms in weight. See how nice that is? Nobody wants to take home a 35 pound spiky fruit, right? Five pound fruit, more reasonable, averaging 2.4 kilograms in weight. Long, narrow, and uniform in size and shape of 38 seeds per fruit. Green skin, long spines that yellow and open slightly upon maturity. Edible pulp averages 33%. 
So you're throwing away most of your five pounds. So you get 33% in the arrows around the seeds. Uh, pulp is deep orange, soft, and fibrous with excellent flavor. Fruit have an intense aroma or usually produce one per shoot without thinning. Heavy fruiting does not damage the tree. Pulp is easily separated from the rag, requiring less than 10 minutes to prepare a fruit for consumption. If you've ever dealt with a jackfruit, that's a, that's a laugh line. Requiring less than 10 minutes to prepare a fruit for consumption. There is little problem with latex in ripe fruit. Other people online have said that thing explodes latex everywhere and is the messiest fruit they've ever dealt with. But according to the release bulletin, there is little problem with latex in the fruit. Tree, open, low, and spreading growth habit can be kept at a height spread of 10 feet. I like that. You can squeeze a 10-foot tree in. Uh, with annual pruning, it consistently produces 50 to 70 kilograms per tree. So it's a very productive tree, stays small, interesting flavor, interesting shape, balances out the problems of the, of the jackfruit and the, and the, and the chempadak. I say give it a go. So we, we've got one at um, Bancroft right now. If it dies over the summer, I'll probably, if it dies over the winter, I'll probably get another one. Um, will it root from cuttings? Are we gonna have to propagate it by grafting it onto uh, seedling jackfruit, which are easily, very easy to come up with? Uh, I don't know. Uh, like I said, I just, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to figure out uh, by experimentation what will work. If it will root from cuttings, by heck, let's root it from cuttings. If we have to uh, grow the root stocks, let's do that. Okay, almost done here. Okay, do you want to hear the whole story on the teak chairs? It's completely, it's the dumbest thing ever. Teak, has anybody seen the teak chairs out there? All right. We used to have a couple named Chris and Elizabeth in the building where I worked, and they were a little bit dis developmentally disabled. They were very well matched. They were very cheerful. They kept each other company. They were wonderful people. At one point, they had access to a trust fund or something where they had money, and they would order random stuff from the internet all day long. Their room filled up with junk, and they kept ordering more stuff. And they would be a new, new, new set of packages every day in the lobby uh, until someone took their trust fund money away from them. One of the things that they got was a pair of matching teak chairs. And I'm not the kind of person to lash out on fancy stuff, but I looked it up on the net and they must have cost between 500 and 800 a piece, depending on if you got them discount or not. They had no room for them in their room. They got stuck in the basement. I asked them very nicely. I, I saw them. I, oh, that possibilities for Bancroft. So I asked them very nicely if I could have them. They said yes. So eventually, when uh, the building was shut down, uh, I was able to get them shipped over to Bancroft. And there are many problems with them. Number one, they needed a coat of linseed oil. They now have two or three coats of linseed oil. And they're still sticky with it. So don't sit on them until I say, okay, because they're sticky with the linseed oil, which is what you do with teak. Number two, they're heavy as heck. Number three, they need a cushion. Number four, if you sit on them crooked, they will fall apart because the joints are loose. It, you know, because you got that sandy soil and one leg goes down and then the whole thing falls apart. So my, the thing with the teak chairs is I have, I went and got 16 pavers. We got to decide where we want to put them, but, or if we want them at all. But if we decide a four by four area, we can lay those pavers and we can set them on the pavers and never move them again. And we can get a little $10 cushion and put it on there. And I think it will be a valuable addition as long, as long as nobody steals it. But that's the whole story of the teak chairs, which is, as I say, ridiculous. But I wanted to tell that properly. Thank you to Chris and Elizabeth who are now patrons of the garden. Okay, almost done here. Tree surgery. I've got two massive tree surgeries. The apple is screwed up. I'm going to have to do a thing on that. The Iona with the diamond muscat, that's also screwed up. It's going to leave a huge wound. I'm going to have to go at it with a hammer and chisel. Um, I have to have make the decision about whether to put the tar on it or not. I have 20 vines. I make 20 pruning cuts per vine per year. That's 400 pruning cuts. It would never occur to me to put the tar on because there's too many cuts and because the grape heals itself up. But with this particular apple and with this particular grape, I'm really looking at it as a situation where there's gonna be a large wound that would take at least five years to heal up. And I'm seeing cracking on the trunk of the diamond muscat because the wood is drying out because it's dead. And when you get that cracking, you get the water in there, there you might get insects in there and that's a concern. So um, I will bake a, I will um, not, not 12, three, 12, four, but as you know, sometime in the winter, we will definitely sit down uh, do an interview where we discuss the pros and cons of tar. Definitely um, uh, do, do the cutting that we need to do and uh, whatever aftercare we decide we, we need to do. And, and those trees will get the care that they need. But it's such a big deal that it would be a really good thing to have it, to have people there and to discuss it and to video it so that um, it can be a permanent part of the, the group's knowledge. That's what I love about the uh, making videos on YouTube. Okay, uh, two quick commercial messages that I'm out of here. 
Number one, 12, three, 12, four will be pruning day. Um, I'm hoping to get a crew of five on the north end, five on the south end to cut and yank the cane. He gave the cane to the cane holder. The cane holder gives it to the runner boy. The runner boy runs back and forth to the corral. Got a couple of five, six people in the corral who are chopping and packing the wood, putting little name tags on it. And then it's all available to pass out. Um, some will go, some will be passed out directly in January. Some will be used at a grafting demonstration for Dr. Hui at Cuyamaca. Some will, um, will go in one gallon pots if I think that they would, there'd be enough demand for it to sell. And then some will eventually just get thrown out in June. But the, the point is to have it all available um, because in the immortal words of Cato, the great Roman farmer, always be selling, never be buying. We have now reached a certain point with the grapes where we have all the grapes we need pretty much and we can distribute the wood and pass it out, pass it out, pass it out. And it doesn't cost the club a penny because it's all just there and it's, we're gonna cut it off and leave it on the ground anyways. So we've gotten to a point of self-sufficiency on grapes, which is extremely delicious. I'm thinking for 12, I'm thinking I'm gonna try and arrive like around eight or nine to make sure the corral is set up and everything is, is good to go. Make sure the, the roses are all strapped, strapped in tight so that the roses don't get anybody. We're probably gonna get the festivities started at 10 in the morning. Uh, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna have apple pie, apple juice. Oh, I got, I got muscadine cider, which is, the uh, very expensive to have it shipped in from, from Georgia because they, they categorized it as wine bottles and they packed it like wine bottles. And anyway, so I got the white cider and the red cider and you could try that. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to plant a muscadine unless they knew what they were getting into. Muscadine is a very distinctive taste and you're gonna wanna have a, get a, get a chance to sip, sip, sip of, of that uh, on 12-3. On well, we don't finish up 12-3, we can finish up 12-4. My father is singing the Messiah at Point Loma Nazarene, so I'm gonna have to jet at one o'clock. But um, we have such a level of skill in this club now that ripping the vines off and chopping them up should be the work of a few moments. Uh, definitely get it, you know, what we don't get done 12-3, 12-4, we'll just get it done the next Sunday. It's not a big deal, but. Um, okay, almost almost to get to the chocolate. Okay, rootstocks. Um, uh, I'm going to go, go ahead and, and make an overbearing demand on everybody. If you're not growing out mango stock, mangoes of some sort, you're letting the club down. Everybody should have a windowsill with, you know, three or four mango rootstocks, a condo patio with a 10 or 20, or a backyard with 100, or acreage with 1,000, whatever, whatever you got, whatever you got. Uh, mangoes are my number one underplanted tree because they're so easy to grow from seed, because they're so trouble-free. They put up with any soil, drought-tolerant, self-fertile, they don't have pest problems massive, gorgeous, lovely, exotic fruit. Um, no reason we shouldn't go full bear. Uh, I wanna see mango seedlings, um, you know, little one gallon mango seedlings that high pouring in from everybody. We've actually gotten to the point where we have enough cherimoya seedlings. I never thought we would, but we now have hundreds of cherimoya seedlings. I'm very happy to see it. We got the cherimoyas going out the door. Uh, I would like to see us get there with hundreds of mango seedlings. So crank it up a notch in terms of your mango production. Um, ask not which the, <laughs> What the club can do for you, ask what you can do for the club. That's my, my John F. Kennedy speech. Bring, bring me the mango seedlings. Okay, uh, chocolate. Um, we're now going, because we're a small enough group, we're going to go into the, the stabbing and sucking on the pulp stage of the evening's presentation. Um, John, how are we on time? We got another five minutes? We're good. All right. So um, let's head over that direction. Okay, uh, I guess you're going to have to transfer all the technology. <laughs> Okay. There are various people in Puerto Rico who will, who will send you stuff. These are from uh, Montoso Gardens, Brian Fuller, I think the fellow's name is. This is not to be confused with Govardhan, who is also on Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is an island that is subject to storms and Govardhan has been hit multiple times by hurricanes. Um, so that's something you want to take into account if you're ever buying property in Puerto Rico is you want to buy it on the side of the island where it gets hit by multiple hurricanes or the side of the island that doesn't. Just a little pro tip for the Puerto Rican land shopper. <laughs> Brian sent me five of these, hard as a rock. Um, they have little letters on them. And in the email, <laughs> Wait, oh. turn it on. <laughs> you... Is it oh, select? No, you just got to hold the power button. Power, which power? 
push and hold the mute. Okay, I can do that. So it's a push and hold. Cool. All right. Okay, so we're looking at chocolate melons here. These came from Montoso, Puerto Rico. I have a color coded. Okay, I got a C, a J, a T, an F, and an N, which would be C for Colorado, J for Hakka round leaf, T for Trinitario, F for Forestero, N for Nacional. Um, as I always do, I went and I looked at a video on how to grow chocolate seedlings, and what they saw terrified me. <laughs> Person takes the choco melon firmly in their left hand, hard as a rock, right? Very tough skin, and they start doing like this. Oh. And I'm an evil scout. I mean, no, 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 do not do this. So, um, yeah, you don't want to pick up the fingers off the ground. So, I would approach this the way I would approach a one of those things. The yellow, no, it's kind of squash. It's yellow inside. It's pink on the outside. Butternut squash. I would approach this like you would approach a butternut squash. Okay. I'm not doing this on the table. I'm going to do this on the floor, but I'm just showing you on the table so you can see. Is to find a rib that looks promising, put the knife in between the rib, and with the fingers, you know, not in the way of the knife, just kind of like bash it down gently on the floor all the way around. So you got to split 180 degrees, pick another rib, gently bash it until you can open it up. We don't want to get, you don't want the, the, the seeds to go on the floor uh, because you don't want to introduce pathogens into it. So you want to get this opened up. It will have the seeds all lined up in white pulp. Who's ever seen, who's ever done a chocolate melon before? Who's never done a chocolate melon? Oh, oh, okay. This is, <laughs> when I teach, when I teach Greek and Latin, I, I, I assume that people know everything beforehand. So the idea of showing novel things to a person is, is very exciting for me. So what we're going to do is we're going to split these open. What you're going to do is you're going to take it apart like an avocado. Uh, all the seeds will go in there. What you want to do is take them to the sink and kind of wash all the white pulp off. At the end of the process, and we should probably label these first. So I have cards. You can actually eat them. We're getting to that. So at the end of the process, we're going to have just the seeds in the water in the plastic tub with a label with a piece of a card and a tape over it so the water doesn't get in that says J for Hakka, whatever it is, or F for Forestero, and no pulp. Now, the whole fun of this is that the pulp is tasty, but what you must not do is suck on it and then introduce your spit culture into the water <laughs> where the thing will be sprouting. So I cannot say no to you, my beloved fellow club members, if you want to suck the white pulp off. If you've never done it, it's quite a thrill, right? One of the initi initiatory thrills of growing your own chocolate. But my advice is, if you want to suck the pulp off, go ahead and do that and then wash the pit off, all right? But at the end of it, we should have five tubs and if people, I have like 11 tubs. So if there's people want to take home a few seeds of this or that, fine, take home a few seeds. What am I going to do with like 500 chocolates? It makes no sense. But um, at the end of the process, all the seeds will be washed off. All the seeds will be in here with water. I will close the tub up. I'll put it on my little heat, heater mat to be 80 degrees. And in a couple of days, it will start to sprout. And then I will have a whole thing. I have my cups on my heater mat. And that's, that'll be a whole other thing. But any, all we can do tonight is to, is to whack them open, get the white goop off, and... Um, and make sure they're labeled. All right, so I guess labeling is the first thing I've lost my pen though. So, so my question to you is, do you have the appropriate I grew one that lasted about a year and then it gave up the ghost. And uh, cacao. You want to grow it in the shade initially. You've got to have a lot of water. I was going to say, why yes? Why yes? I do actually have four acres in Hawaii to grow them on, but that would be just a joke. My <laughs> sister, my sister, this is, this is a CRFG joke. My sister married a guy who has a four acre estate in Hawaii, and they, they're bringing up my niece there, and they're, they're, they're happy, and they're like right next door to Mark Zuckerberg. My sister will literally not let me come to Hawaii <laughs> because she knows that if I get if I set foot on her four acres in Hawaii, I will start planting plants and doing plant things, and she will never get rid of me. So she is not letting me come to Hawaii. Now, what I have, a very good question. What I have, okay, I gave you the list of the five, the five uh, real gems that you're not going to be able to do unless you're, you know, so professionalized in a, a fruit nut that you have your own greenhouse. And that would be the Theobroma cacao, Dorian, the fancy Articarpus, uh, Degetias, and... Um, I forget what the fifth one doesn't matter. Um, coconut. coconut, yeah, coconut's on the list. Um, 
But what you can do, you can definitely get a heat mat for 75 bucks and you can get Sterilite tubs at Walmart. That's within yeah. everybody's price range. You get you know, 10 or 15 bucks to get a Sterilite tub and a sheet of plexiglass to go on top of the Sterilite tub because the lid that comes with the Sterilite tub is opaque, which is not what you want for plants. So you have to get a, a sheet of plexiglass to go on top. Now I've got a four foot by two foot heater mat, heater mat to where mm -hmm. I can just go, I want it 80 degrees. I put the knob to 80 degrees, done, problem solved. So nice living in 2022. I have a Sterilite tub here. I have a Sterilite tub here. I'm shooting for 100 solo cups, of which I have 200. This is where the American patriotism comes in. How do I get 100, sterile, 100 solo cups into two Sterilite tubs? In a big plastic tub. Big plastic tub like that. Mm -hmm. I do array, an array of six by five, which is how many? 30. 30. And then- Mark, do you put the heater in the tub or under the tub? Under the tub. Under. Right, you don't put, I have a concrete floor in a basement where I am. So you don't put the heater right on the concrete floor because then half your heat is lost to the concrete, which is valueless. So I laid out a half inch of, I think it's sound insulating material. We have it in the basement. It's like this foofy stuff that you use on the inside of a, a soundproofing. Anyway, it's foofy and it, it doesn't conduct to heat. It's very uh, porous. So I put that down first. Then I put down the heater mat. Then I put down the sterilite tubs. But I'm doing a mathematical thing. We must concentrate. This is very important. Mathematical thing. So. I have my Sterilite tub, I do. I can do a six by five array, which is 30, but then I want to set a second array on top that are staggered. And so that would not be six by five, that would be five by four, which is 20. Together that makes 50 in one Sterilite tub and 50 in the other Sterilite tub. That's why I'm shooting for a hundred. Now, why is this patriotic? Because if you imagine the stars and bars, we have 50 states and there's a six by five array of white stars and then a four by five array of white stars staggered within that. And that's how our 50 stars are arranged. Unless you're in Athens, Georgia, where they do folk art. And I swear we cracked up every time we drove by this building. They had an American flag on the side of a building and it was seven stars by seven stars, which makes 49. And they put an extra one right in the middle. <laughs> that's how they do it in Georgia. Anyway, so that's how um, we call this onging it up. If you've ever been to Ong's nursery, you know that Mr. Ong will go one, two, three to where it looks like the hanging gardens of Babylon and the, the plants are up like this and then the water just cascades down. So you got six by five, five by four, 50, 50, 100. I'm probably gonna have a lot of extra seeds to pass out. It doesn't really matter. Now, could I volunteer? I think we can do this on the floor without too much damage. I've got a hammer out here. Yeah, if you want. Strong hands, it's painting strong hands. Mark, yes. so how long will these have to be in your greenhouse? before you can take them out and put them in the spring? Good question. I'm getting a jump now on the growing season. They should be six inch to 12 inch by the time the October plant sale runs around. In other words, I can repot them to one gallons and sell them for five or 10 bucks. How long till they bear fruit after that? I don't know, four or five years. The nice thing about tropical plants is they do grow very fast and die very fast, grow very fast if they're happy and die very fast if they're not. So you get very quick feedback from them. At what height or time frame do they not require to grow in the shade? They're always in the shade. They're always in the shade. Yeah. Vietnam and they, they grow underneath. Yeah, it's an understory plant. Is it? They always grow underneath the coconut tree. Yeah. They never grow outside right. the okay. coconut tree. So how tall do they need to get before they produce fruit? Taller than me. Yeah. yeah. About ten Five foot. Eight foot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. they actually the SDSC greenhouse has some flowering cacao. I mean, theirs isn't completely heated. It's like a, it's got like a slat roof, so it just kind of retains some of the heat. It might be, we're checking out, they're open in midday, usually. So Evan's club actually has cow plants, and I think he actually got in the pot. He grows them actually kind of outdoors, like kind of between some buildings, I guess. I don't know exactly, mm -hmm. but they grow for him. And he got in pot. I remember he got a pot. I, I didn't, I, there was like one meeting that I missed, but. That was one of the things is the pod that he had grown himself. So he has the right microclimate he has done. So okay, so we I guess you can come up as your as your passions dictate. Um they, these might be sprouted, they might be rotten, I don't know. We'll see. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, you do get a little bit of alcoholic smell. Yeah, pass it around for a smell. 
Oh my gosh. Is it yeah, they should put those <laughs> some of those are not in those. Holy cow. <laughs> it's not a fragrance. It's not strong. Strong. It's, it's it's very very strong. Strong. It's very strong. Very strong. It's very strong. So how do they make chocolate? You uh you attack that and then you roast the, the seed up and then you fragment it. Oh, you roast it then? Roast? Uh, actually, you dry it up and then you ro roast, roast it. it. Yeah. Oh. The steak, I like, think, set up us, put it in there, and then there's brow. You just dry it up. And it oh, just dry it in the you ship with these seeds. Oh. And then you just smash it. And right. then you just Let's it. get these cut up and yeah, yeah, kind you know. of like an alcohol. So, so, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a good yeah. sharp knife. So, wait a minute. So, where are cocoa nibs in this process? Yeah. Yes. Actually, all right. So the, the making of chocolate is a whole separate night, but while we're busy, I will give you a quick sketch. The main thing to keep in mind with making chocolate is it takes three separate complicated pieces of machinery, each one about a thousand bucks. We're talking about a $5,000 investment if the club wants to get into making chocolate. I don't see you can't make it. I don't see you can't make it. We've got plenty of money if that's what we really want to do. It, it's tricky. Let me, let me give it to you. Let me give you the sketch. These are, Oh, that's fine. Whatever. Yeah, just crack it open. Yeah. You know, you're the pro on this. Yeah. There you go. Show this boss. I think it's a different world. Yeah. 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 Number one, it's not going to taste like Hagen Dawes chocolate. Ice. <laughs> There's a white. Is it smell better? Or if we can make the right sort of. It's not like. It's not like banana. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like banana. banana. It's like a whole banana. That one smells a lot better. Yeah. It's, it's not a like banana. Yeah. Whole variety banana. Very whole variety banana. Yeah, it does. Whole variety banana. Over banana. banana. I don't know. Want to keep that from Costco and it's over ripe? I smell it. Banana. Over ripe banana. I like the way it's coming out better. It's a small crust. You have to ferment it and you have to roast it. And then you should just dry it up. This one is tag on. We're supposed to be making the tags, putting them on the tag. It's really cool. Uh, figure out what your letter is. Use your F. It's F for Forestero. I don't know if we could trace it. There you go. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Sorry. Mark, you didn't answer my question. Where did cocoa nibs fit in? Okay, what happens with these guys is they look like almonds, but they don't have a solid structure like almonds. The first step is to ferment them. After you ferment them and you roast them, in the process of roasting, the shell falls off, and you see that there's a lot of intricate. Um, they fall apart into nibs. The, the structure of it is that the nibs are the little pieces that it falls apart into. Um, we will take one of these. We'll sacrifice it, like this one, and I will wash it off because it's slimy. I'll come back and I'll soak it. So wait a minute, wait, wait. It's actually better to cut it this way and go all the way around. 
and then I'll we'll show you on the next step. You're going to have to cut those up. Yeah, exactly how you look at the yeah, this is the white one, and there's like a shell, it's got a little papery shell to it, just like an almond. But the thing is, it's very simple. <laughs> no, the nibs, you need natural decisions that it falls apart into, and that may not kill the tip. Okay, cut it. Ah. Okay, so if you look in there, there's the, you can see it has little divisions. And once it's roasted, it will fall apart into those little divisions. How does it taste raw? I wouldn't get raw. You want to ferment it, and you want to roast it. And once it's roasted, it develops those baking uh, chocolate brownie aromas in the roasting process. Then you can recognize the shock. So raw. How much chocolate smell on it until it's roasted? You need the chemical reaction for the roasting. Right. That's how it goes. I understand. Okay, got it. Thank you. Now, the process goes to ferment them, like roast coffee lines. And then when they're roasting, they loosen the shells, and you have to break them up and take a lower of the it gets rid of the shaft, and it's lighter, because you have just the minute to the shell. Yeah, so for the nibs, I mean, uh, you can do a coarse brush, do a food processor, and kitchen aid thing, and that's a coarse brush. But you can't get a fine brush, one professional chocolate fine brush, a kitchen aid. What you have to have is a professional punching machine that's pushed the particles up to like one microphone. That's considered good chocolate. So, what you do is you get an Indian lentil grinder, this is what they do on the net. Which has three granite rollers. Oh, and you put your chocolate in, yeah, and the granite rollers will run around for 48 hours. It's heat as the constant grinding by the three concrete, the three uh, granite rollers, and it brings it down to like, one micron. And that is good for chocolate. You put your, put your sit yeah. in It's quite a process. There's lots of websites. If you're in touch with the, the Facebook page, I can link to a chocolate alchemist. Chocolate you Alchemist will sell you all the machinery yeah. and he'll sell you the bags of the beans. Yeah. And he's not getting into it. Yeah. Yeah. It might be fun for the club to do it once. Yeah. You, could, you could rent the equipment from Chihuahua. The yeah. thing I thought would be really fun would be to do an expedition up to Carlsbad, which is where the Chihuahua Chocolate Factory is, and their premier chocolate. They have like 47 different companies. They're the Willy Wonka of Southern California. They're my drug of choice. Chihuahua Smokes. Yeah, take this thing, get all the goop off, and away you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for my personal baby, 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 for my personal Theobromine. Well, you gotta get the theobromine. That's a, it got me through many a dark night. I'll tell you, theobromine. But yeah, the nibs are a natural part of the process. It's the, it's the internal structure, the internal structure of the chocolate. Uh, when it's roasted, it falls apart into those little nibby structures. Separating the, 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 the parts. I have a macadamia. Okay, guys. We're gonna. If uh, anyone has any questions, Mark can probably address those. But if not, um, we're gonna call it a. Cold and evening for Zoom at least. I want to know is there any place where I can bring the nuts to have the crack? I have the individual crackers and the macadamia. I don't see any right now. So uh, if you. Yeah, thank you guys. Have a great night. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next event. Yeah. Good night, CRFG. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, excellent idea. Why would you?